Um, yeah, I actually. <laughs> um, once you have the piece in place, it's going to want to warp and, uh, and buckle. So that's what I use this for. Or you can use something like this, or you can use the edge of a credit card, or you or can use yeah, those pallet knives that uh, Michael and showed you for a dollar and a half. Dollar and a half. <laughs> what you need to do is just squeeze out the excess glue, and then uh, any matte medium that you see around the surface will disappear as it uh, as it dries. Now, if you find a piece where placement is really critical, sometimes, you know, you get it placed just so, and then you pick it up and put the stuff on the back and put the glue down, and then you have a hard time remembering exactly where it was. So if placement is real critical, just hold it down on one end. Do it. Well, you get the idea. Do it half at a time. And then don't forget to coat the If you find after these material the collage materials are attached and you wanted to go in and do a little something more with uh, with a thin wash uh, of of color as I said, the, the matte medium resists the watercolor, so you won't be able to paint over it with watercolor. But if you take acrylic and thin it out with water so that it becomes about the same consistency as watercolor, that will adhere. Now for a couple of minutes, you're just going to have to watch me glue here. I noticed you choose smaller pieces. Is there, um, what are you thinking about <laughs> when you pick your smaller pieces and put them out? Um, that the big piece is too intrusive? It can be too intrusive, um, but, but not necessarily, not necessarily. The, um, I guess the reason I'm inclined to use the smaller pieces is in my experience, the larger pieces, um, it's harder to get them flat on the surface. And because of that, they tend to read as collage material rather than a, a part of the painting. And I do, I do think of this as more an accent than... Uh, really dramatically changing the painting in any way. Like I say, once you get that design, once you get those shapes in place, then you're, uh, you're really pretty much frosting the cake after, after that point rather than making big changes. However, this is, this is your one last opportunity to salvage your white. If you're not happy with the white shape, by cutting out some white pieces, you can redesign that shape. Uh, by adding by adding white back in, and that that can be quite effective. I always feel kind of strange when I just have to sit and do this stuff. Though you watch, it's kind of like dead air. But then, I my wife wrote an article on uh, the Asilomar workshops in California for one of the magazines, and. Uh, the way we researched that was we went to Asilomar, which is uh, just this beautiful facility. It's, it's a state park now, or a national state park, I think. Right on the shores of, uh, right on the beach in Pacific Grove, California. And you know those California cypress trees that you always see in paintings, the trees that sort of bend over and, and mold themselves to the beach, are... Uh, that's primarily where they're located in California, is, is at Silomer. So we went there, and we met with uh, Jane Burnham, 
who was one of the first instructors of the Silomar. The workshop was run by Jade Fawn. It went on for years and years and years. Uh, a lady named Patty Allen, who now runs the Yosemite workshop, who was a student at a Silomar for almost 25 years. And Pam Della, who ran it for the last 17 years it was in existence. And then we, we pulled a couple of couches around the fireplace at night and got a bottle of wine and put the tape recorder on, and then they just told stories from Asilomar, and they were all legendary people in watercolor. They would tell about when, when uh, Robert Wood came and the demonstration he did, and when Milford Zorns was there. And uh, the one story they told that I'll never forget was Jade Fawn, a watercolorist who ran the workshop for years, got his daughter to come to a workshop, and she had never uh, painted before let alone go to a workshop, and she was she was there kind of under duress. She didn't really want to be there. And I believe it was Milford Zorns was the teacher, but I'm, I'm, I, I don't recall for sure. It doesn't matter. Um, for whatever reason, he decided he was not going to demonstrate during the workshop, and everybody really wanted him to, to demonstrate. Um, so he was walking around making his rounds, and, and Jade Fawn's daughter had this had her paper in front of her and was just sitting there staring at it. And he said, what's the problem? She said, I don't have a clue. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to start. And he said, okay, let me show you. So he sat down at her place and he took her paints and everything and proceeded for about the next hour to do a complete painting. Well, of course, everybody in the workshop that was starving for a demo jumped up and they, they were all standing around in a semicircle watching him demonstrate. And he, so he, he completed this painting, and he even signed it. And then he stood up and he said, Jade Fon's daughter, he said, okay. He said, now you give it a try. So she said, okay, and went and took her sponge and wiped out the whole painting. <laughs> 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 oh, what an idiot. But the thing that I found out through the re researching this article is for years the way workshops worked is the artist would gather everybody together in the morning. They would do up to a three-hour demo with no talking. You were just, you had the privilege to watch that artist paint. There was no attempt at instruction other than what you could learn from watching. And then the artist said, see ya at five o'clock this afternoon for a critique. And then everybody was just on their own for the rest of the day. So... Given the rich history of watercolor, I shouldn't feel like I have to talk all the time, I guess. But. So give me a minute here to get these glued down, and then I'll show you the next. Once this dries, this matte medium, there's no going back. Uh, you cannot get it off. Sometimes, if you can catch an edge, you can peel it, and what, what will actually happen is the uh, paper is in two layers. The, the top layer peels off, leaving the bottom layer. and you can get some, some interesting textural effects. Since most of my shapes are hard-edged in nature, um, I sometimes like to tear off a piece if I can, so I get at least one piece that has a, a torn edge. It, it can be a very, very nice contrast. Now, regarding subject matter, the reason I ask you to avoid subject matter is uh, <coughs> subject matter has content. And content has design weight in the picture. And to, to give you an extreme example of that, let's say in this painting, for whatever reason, 
I decide I want to put a little red swastika down in this corner or some other symbol that has you know, universal, powerful imagery, powerful meaning. If I do that here, then I've got to do something really, really bold and really dramatic design-wise in some other part of the painting to compensate for that. And that's because subject matter, recognizable subject matter introduces content, and content then has to be figured in as part of your design. And the story that I like to tell about that is we're going around doing this collage and I look over somebody's shoulder and here they've got a picture of Snoopy <laughs> cut out and that there. I, I said, now remember, no recognizable subject matter. Said, well, this is going to be for my, what was their grandson's bedroom or something. So I said, well, I'm sorry, you can't use it. So then, <laughs> the last day in the critique when her painting went up, someone had found this giant picture of Snoopy that she <laughs> didn't really paste it on her collage. But, um, <laughs> And I know it's tempting. Did you know she framed it like that, John, with that giant Snoopy on there? No. She did. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's in her grandson's bedroom. Oh my gosh. Seriously? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I guess what you it do was after cute. I mean, after it you, really yeah, it's was cute. 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 <laughs> cute is right. After you leave the workshop, what you, you're on your own. <laughs> There's no follow-up. No but. Of these. <laughs> Rules are made to be broken. Well, one thing, though, that I do have to talk about just a little bit is, now, some of these, I think you'll, you'll be pleasantly surprised when we do the critique. Um, some of these will, in fact, be show quality. No shows will allow you to do work, enter work that you did in a workshop or under an instructor's care. Um, my feeling about that personally is I have absolutely no problem with, with what you do with your painting that you produce here because I, I'm showing you a methodology. You're doing the painting. I feel it, it truly is an original piece of work that you've done. However, if you were to, be, to do it and someone were to say, you know, she did that in a workshop, then it would be embarrassing. Um, Three years ago, I think, National Watercolor Society, the painting that received first place in the show. Um, and then, you know, prior to the show opening, the catalog went out. The day the catalog hit the mail, NWS started getting letters and emails from all over the country. People saying, "Do you know that that's a Toyota ad?" Oh. What it was was a junkyard with a whole pile of, of old engine blocks, and then the engine block in the middle had the Toyota logo on it. And uh, so they contacted the artist, because this, I think, first prize is over $2,000 plus, uh, well, the notoriety of winning first place. So they called the lady up who did it, and she said, well, yes, I did look at that ad, but I changed it pretty significantly. So that someone took a slide then of the ad and projected it on her painting, and it was absolutely identical. So they had to call her up, and they said, we're not going to make a big deal of this, but you have to send the prize money back. And um, they, they kind of decided to, to be low-key. A um, few years before that, a similar thing happened at American Watercolor Society when Mario Cooper was president. A guy copied a picture and sent it in, and it got a pretty substantial award. And, then they found out about it. Mario Cooper called the guy up and told him, return you the prize money, return your AWS signature letters, and never enter this show again. And, it, I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of watercolors out there, but you do one dumb thing and get caught, and you'll find out what a small world it is. <laughs> Of course, with people like me going around telling those stories, I suppose it helps. All right, another thing that uh, you can use the collage material for at this point is reintroducing some linear effects. And if you, if you have trouble with straight lines, this is, this is a pretty effective way to make some... some very hard, sharp, straight lines. Just do them using 
uh, using collage material. How'd you cut that so perfectly? Freehand. Really? Yeah, and you know wh how I learned to cut freehand? Cutting sheetrock with Grandpa George. Seriously? Yes, he would draw a pencil line and then take his utility knife and cut it absolutely straight. And I said, how do you do that? He said, you watch about this far ahead of your hand. You keep your eye on the line significantly ahead of where you're cutting and just make sure your eye keeps moving and your hand will follow your eye perfectly right on the line. Really? Yep. That's the way uh, people... Sherry's, do Sherry's dad is who I learned that from. What was that? I, that's how you cut fabric too. When you're, you're uh, making garments or quilts or whatever, you don't look at the scissors mm -hmm. where it enters the fabric. You look ahead and move it. Well, when they train sharpshooters in Vietnam, um, they they train them with BB guns, and they there was a certain place on the stock where you laid your finger that correlated with the sights. And then what you had to do is you had to bring the gun up and point at whatever you wanted to shoot at and then pull the trigger simultaneously. And they say when you point, you're dead on for the first instance. Instant. And that's how they that's how they trained them to shoot. And they got those guys so they could hit another BB in the air with a BB. So. Now these linear effects that I'm adding here are <coughs> intended to be calligraphy. They're intended to um, they're intended to just simply be linear effects. They're not meant to necessarily define existing shapes. It's just the calligraphy that we add in at the at the end. <coughs> you have a couple of areas yet of your white that are still running off the paper. Are you still are you concerned with that yet? Do those need to be those areas filled in at some point? Closed off at the end? Yeah. Thank you. Quite possibly. Okay. I was going to ask it just the opposite way. I have oh. left none. You running off to all the way to the edge. Is that a problem? It depends. What you have to do is assess the particular area and see if it um, if it tends to pull your eye out or if it tends to bring it back into the composition. So you you just have to make that that decision, I guess. If it's if it's pulling your eye out, then it's probably a bad thing. All right, next thing I'm going to show you, another technique for the additional line is, is simply to go to a permanent, to use a permanent black.